You gonna help Grom conquer the world, or what? The infamous goblin war boss, Grom the Paunch. Some may tremble at the sound of his name, but I assure you there is nothing to fear from this so-called great warlord. Let's start with his claim to fame. The fact that he ate troll meat and somehow survived, gaining strength and speed. What some may see as a sign of his resilience, I see as nothing more than a stroke of dumb luck. It takes more than raw strength to lead an army, and Grom has shown time and again that he is lacking in strategy and leadership. But let's not forget about his so-called magical food. While it may give his army temporary buffs, it's nothing more than a cheap trick to make up for his own shortcomings. Real leaders rely on their own skills and strategy to win battles, not on some foul-smelling gruel. And speaking of strategy, let's talk about Grom's brilliant decision to invade the High Elven homeland. It was a reckless move, and he paid the ultimate price for it. The Elves are a formidable foe, with centuries of knowledge and experience in magic and warfare. Grom was foolish to think he could defeat them with brute force alone. But what really grinds my gears is the fact that Grom claims to be a king. A king, forsooth. He's nothing more than a lowly goblin who got lucky once. He may have some strength and speed, but he lacks the true qualities of a leader. Honor, courage, and most of all, intelligence. In conclusion, my friends, let us not be swayed by the tales of Grom the Paunch. He is not a true warlord, not a true leader, not even a true king. He is a mere footnote in the annals of history, a blip on the radar of true power and true leadership. Let us stand firm in our own skills and strategy, and let us never be cowed by the likes of Grom. Grom may have some followers now, but when it comes down to it, he is no match for the might of the Empire. So let us all raise a glass to Grom the Paunch, the so-called Great Warlord, who is nothing more than a buffoon with a belly full of bad food. May his reign be short and his legacy forgotten, while the Empire continues to thrive and grow under my leadership. Welcome everyone, Costini here with my campaign overview guide for Grom the Paunch and Total War Warhammer 3 Immortal Empires. A legendary lord that's been one of the most powerful in the game ever since he was introduced in Warhammer 2. But how is that? Well, he's a legendary lord for a very powerful race and he buffs it to a ridiculous extreme level to the point that his campaign is a steamroll. And just understand that unlike many of the warriors of Chaos and many of the greenskins, Grom doesn't start in a necessarily easy starting position. A lesser legendary lord would actually struggle over here, but Grom? Grom, he thrives. Now, what makes the starting position difficult? Well, the climate itself is unpleasant, so it's going to cost long, uh, cost more, replenishment's going to be lower, control's going to be lower, your income is going to be lower. It uh, is unpleasant to deal with unpleasant climate. On top of that, you have Ulfwan right over here next to you, and Ulfwan hates you, especially Elfarian. Elfarian absolutely despises you with every fiber of your be uh, of his being because of what Grom has done. So you've got the High Elves right next to you and a, a very powerful faction right next to you that really hates you. That is very good at countering Greenskins because they have powerful uh, ranged units. Then on top of that you have the four Wood Elven faction over here in Aphalorn who also despise you. Then there's also Belagar and the Empire and then all of Bretonia. Every single person that surrounds you hates you. With the exception of these minor uh, greenskins, Mogur to an extent, and Ikekla. But it, relying on Mogur and Ikekla as well as a minor faction for allies is a very questionable decision in the best case scenario. So this could be a very rough campaign, but Grom makes it pathetically easy if you know what you're doing in terms of some of the mechanics. So, here's the thing about Grom. Campaign-wide effects, he doesn't necessarily have anything special on the list here, at least it doesn't seem so. Though he does get that global recruitment duration, so he can global recruit any goblin unit within one turn. That means he can use global recruitment over here, for instance, let's say I build a second army, and you should always use goblin great shamans as opposed to night goblin war bosses. 
uh, because they have this particular skill, Goblin Tide, which gives four, uh, 15 armor to Goblin units. But it means that I can, from turn 1, get free Goblin units with Global Recruitment, start building a second powerful army. Which you may want to do so for um, turn 1, though it is going to put a strain on your economy. Then Grom himself, skill-wise, uh, he gets a Lord Effect, that uh, Lord Effect that gives you a minus 50% upkeep for chariots and pump wagons. 10 leadership when fighting against elves. I assume this means all elves, including wood elves. Physical resistance for goblin units, 10%. And then special skill line, he gets 15 growth, casualty replenishment, hit points, armor for chariots, pump wagons. He does have the goblin tide skill, uh, skill which makes him far more useful on this skill alone than Skarsenik is. And he gets more income from post battle loot and sacking settlement as well as a rattled effect. He also gets an item very early on in his campaign that allows him to summon a temporary rogue idol. It will diminish very quickly, but it has a real significant amount of power because a rogue idol is even a summonable one that you have to rely on your giant river, uh, giant river troll hack to summon is a ridiculous amount of power that you can have early on in your campaign. And by the way, a great thing about Grom is he has some really good units at, um, uh, at winning in a siege. Because one of the problems a lot of factions, a lot of legendary lords may have in their campaigns is they can struggle to actually besiege settlements. Well, you start with trolls and catapults, so you have very good and effective ways of breaking down walls and, sm and just taking units and smashing through gates with the trolls alone. And Grom himself is a pretty decent fighter, so you have a powerful army, pretty decent lord effects. But that's just the beginning of Grom's madness. See, Grom can cook. Now, in order to cook effectively, you're going to need to do certain things in your campaign. For instance, uh, w the first thing you should do once you fight your initial battle hero Will against Aquitaine is sack the settlement. The reason you want to do so is because it will unlock ocean clams after uh, you uh, sack a Bretonian settlement. This will give you a random amount of money and 10% casualty replenishment while the effect is active. You literally can print money in this campaign, but you will need 50 scrap. You will need a decent amount of scrap in order to be able uh, to cook uh, over there. But that's relatively easy enough to get a hold of early on uh, in your campaign. Once you get 50 scrap, you start cooking, you'll get a decent amount of scrap. Uh, you do start with troll meat, so that's regeneration for goblins and night goblin units. You then get ocean clams, and you start printing money. It is ridiculous. And some of the effects here, like you can get growth in all provinces really nice, very quickly if uh, you follow Black uh, Tooth's advice. Pretty easy to do so, by the way, because you will get the quest to follow his advice very quickly. Like. Um, just cooking, like you'll get a quest to cook a recipe, just do so. You'll also get a quest to get that uh, rogue idol item. So there's a lot of power to be unlocked in this campaign early on. But then there's explosive ammunition for all your goblins. Explosive ammunition for archer units is ridiculously powerful and very few factions actually have that kind of power in their campaigns. Like, I would recommend getting rid of the barracks here in the Maris of Oracle and getting the idols so you get growth and building up. Like, if you have the King and the Warlord, once you get to Tier 2, what you want to do is you want to get the barracks again. Like, yeah, abandon your new Tier 1 barracks because it's going to take too many turns if you keep it and you don't switch the idols. So abandon your Tier 1 barracks, switch the idols. It would be much better if you started with the Tier 2 settlement. Just less hassle. Um, but once you get to tier 2, rebuild the barracks, it's not going to cost that much. Get Nasty Skulkers if you have the King and the Warlord DLC. If you don't have the King and the Warlord DLC, I'd recommend then starting to build a Troll Cave. I would not necessarily get the Trolls, I would instead wait until tier 3 to get Stone Trolls, and of course increase your Giant River Troll Hag capacity. You could, of course, get that tier 3, the Stone Troll country, uh, uh, Quarry, but I'd recommend getting the Hag Hut regardless. Or you could decide not to and instead, uh, what instead you could do is at tier 2, uh, you get the Barracks if you have the King and the Warlord. At tier 3, you get the Stone Troll Quarry. And at tier 4, uh, you get the Shaman Hut in order to increase your, to get some Shamans so you have those uh, powerful casters. Now, campaign plan situation. 
uh, research, it's pretty straightforward. G get the wall, get gobby gobos, or get the wall and then go faster. Actually, that might be the best play because you do have a lot of, you do have a huge amount of territory here to cover in Bretonia, especially here in the south. So getting that campaign movement range can be significant. But what you need to know about the research of the greenskins is that they have a lot of benefits they can get early on for the go their goblins. So gobby gombos, use them. Uh, Gamba Crackdown, Egamon, all that kind of stuff. It's there's some very significant benefits over there, um, and you pair that with the Cauldron. This is why this campaign is extremely powerful. Use them in particular for a seven armor is something I'd highly recommend. But here's what I do as a campaign plan: I wipe out Aquitaine very quickly. But here's uh, here's something you should always consider. You have this minor green skin faction over here, and you should make deals with them and try and keep them alive because having at least one ally can be really, really useful. But of course, they're gonna be wiped out very quickly by the Fae Enchantress, so one of the things you can do, and maybe you should do, is give Aquitaine, like you take Aquitaine. She's not gonna be able to take Brion turn one. She just doesn't have the movement range. So you have at least one turn. So you take Aquitaine, you build some units, you get global recruitment, build some units, local, global, and then you go take Bartolo. You take Bartolo or you raise it to the ground so you don't encounter Elfarian. Though encountering Elfarian having sending stacks across the sea is not necessarily a downside, by the way, because it's very easy for, to isolate those kind of armies being sent across the sea and just wipe them out. But take Aquitaine and hold it for one turn, click the enter button, recruit, and then sell it over, once you moved out of position to besiege Bordelow, um, sell it to the Red Cloud Greenskins and get start getting diplomatic deals with them. After that, go for Bastan. You can go for Bastan. You can go uh, for Monfort. You can take out the dwarves here. And you may want to take out the dwarves here as well. Always remember, you can globally recruit units in one turn so you d so you don't have to worry about like oh i can't recruit the unit no you just globally recruit like that's what you should do or you hold on to bertolo for a couple of turns uh you hold on to bertolo for a couple of turns in order to recruit while you're still in this province and then you sell it to the red cloud but eventually you do want to sell the entirety of the equity aqu to them um and then you want to go to deal with Karak ziffin uh the reason you want to deal with Karak ziffin it comes down to uh, the fact that they uh, do give you a particular benefit, uh, specifically the Stunty Ale. Now, the reason you want to get the Stunty Ale uh, by going after Karak Ziffin is it's going to be difficult getting it otherwise. And the way the cooking works is you want to unlock all the slots here. But in order to unlock the slots and so on, you need to do cooking challenges for... Um, for the giant river troll hag that's going to show up uh, in your campaign randomly D gives you a couple of options either you can get a random ingredient unlocked or you can get the cooking challenge to get more slots over here now ideally you want to get more slots if you could do it from the first cooking challenge that would be the best situation but typically speaking you might want to unlock a couple of things before you take on that challenge so for instance you know sacking a dark elf settlement can be something of an unpleasant situation uh to deal with or you could wait until you get at least one of each type like orange yellow blue red or green before you start taking on the cooking challenges over there and just get random ingredients from uh from the hag while when she spawns Take Harris Finn, take Baston, take Monfort, and then go for Paravon. Now, at this point, um, Orion should be moving over here. I mean, the Fae Enchantress, she's gonna move over here to deal with Aquitaine. Like, what you're doing is gonna move in a circle, take Paravon. Now, Paravon's great because it's a tier 3 settlement, and you can take it basically at tier 2 uh, very quickly. But the Fae Enchantress might be pressuring the Red Cloud, who are gonna be here in Aquitaine. You can either let her do so, or you can build a second army to just basically pressure her. Just remember one thing. You have the underway ability. So even if you're here, it's easy enough to just use the underway to teleport here and just beat the crap out of the Fey Enchantress. And then eventually take the territory. Build a circle here, take this territory. And then you do have the choice of whether or not you go to war with Half Lauren, or you decide to head over to Ulfwan. 
if you stay around here, it's going to be a hell of a fight dealing with the entirety of Alpha Lauren. It is one you can win, but you do have a major choice in this campaign. Do you stick around to fight the endless fights in your initial province, or do you go for the safer route? And I use quotation marks over there. The safer route, one of the safer route, would be to take the mountains from Kemler, take northern Bretonia. That would be a relatively safer route, or the quote-unquote safer route is to invade Ulfwan, like just ignore the dwarves to, to a certain extent and invade Ulfwan very quickly and take Tor of Rest. That would be a hell of a fight, early game fight, but if you wipe out Alfarian, no other faction really in Ulfwan is going to pose that much of a challenge, in particular if you, if you make an alliance with these greenskins, if they're still alive by the time you get there, you make an alliance with them, and you start moving over here, you deal with Akari, and Akari doesn't stand up to you. You take over the north, uh, trying to avoid Tyrion and Alariel for a while. You go over the north, you take the Sword of Cain, or you take rather the Shrine of Cain, you won't be able to get the sword yourself. Um, you can take over the north, conquer Ulfwan. That would be the quote-unquote safer option. Just understand, conquering Wolfwan is not an easy affair in any campaign. But you're uniquely well-suited to dealing with it. Or you could conquer Northern Bretonia and conquer Wolfwan simultaneously at the same time, taking advantage between, of the fighting between Bretonia and the Red Duke and Kemler uh, for your own uh, benefit. Or you could just take out Kemler very quickly in this campaign, like go to Montfort, take over uh, Blackstone, Post, right? Uh, pick that fight with Kemler. There are s the problem with Bretonia is that there's a lot of provincial capitals and there's some powerful garrisons. But here's the thing, you have an army that's much more powerful than any other army. Like your trolls annihilate anything in a battle. Your nasty skulkers annihilate anything in a straight up battle. The only issue, the only vulnerability you have is against masses of range units like the Wood Elves. That is an issue. Or against the sheer insanity that someone like Durfu can pull before. The only threat in this campaign, the only serious threat in this campaign, if you're careful and you don't pick stupid fights, is Durfu. Because he has a much more powerful army than you do. Uh, the reason Durfu is so dangerous is he has three can three men, so those have fear, they have terror, so they can easily rout your army and they can take a lot of punishment. Three can are absolute danger, absolutely dangerous. So if you're going to be dealing with Durfu, I'd recommend having a Wa army available, and I also recommend having multiple armies uh, to deal with him. Durfu won't necessarily declare war on you, just remember a lot of the factions that surround you Only have a major aversion against you. You're not going to be able to keep uh, allies, with the exception of Ekeklaw and the Red Cloud. Like This is why keeping the Red Cloud is so substantial, because if you give them Bordolo, it won't. they won't be so easily wiped out. Hell, even if you take Carcassonne and then give that to them because you don't want to have a border here, they'll do a pretty decent job at surviving, but you just need to help them ensure their survival against the Fae Enchantress. And just having that one reliable ally can make a huge difference in a campaign because yeah, it's going to keep your enemies occupied. This is the reason why the Vassal system is so powerful for the Warriors of Chaos. It's because it gives you those allies that will help stabilize your campaign situation. Or you can play a uh, very solo and selfish, uh, you can go for a solo selfish experience, which would be very fitting for Grom, because that's kind of how he is as a character. Play solo and selfish and just conquer everything around you. Go for a, this is total war campaign where you, where you just declare war on every faction the moment you meet them. Would be a hell of a challenge, I admit, given the very open starting position you have here, but it can be worked on it can be done the major challenge would actually be Aphalorin, but if you can overcome that you're set no one's going to be able to stop you with the exception of Aphalorin. like the wood elves and it takes all of the wood elves united to even pose a real challenge in your campaign uh, the wood elves are the only serious challenge uh, in your campaign over here everyone else is just a speed bump especially when you get wa armies uh, going and you have the, you know, you, you should build a ranged army. Uh, you should build a combination of nasty skulkers, trolls, uh, and goblin archers, then into night goblin archers, and use the the wa army to just soak hits while your nasty skulkers charge in, your trolls charge in, your ranged units do a lot of damage, 
and just annihilate everyone that stands in your path. Like, you might do a lot worse in auto resolve than you would in an actual battle. Like, if I if I auto resolve this on legendary very hard, the casualties I'll take will be medium. But if I fight this battle, I'll barely lose any units. This is something that needs to be seen in order to be understood. I didn't re necessarily realize it at first, just how crazy the Greenskin armies are currently in the game. And especially Grom's army, armies with the trolls, the abilities he has in battle, that... Uh, suffice it to say, this might be a campaign... Like, you cannot resolve a lot of the battles in this campaign, but you are a lot more effective in a manual battle uh, than through the auto resolve. This applies to most campaigns, but this feels like on the same level as Skaven. It's not necessarily something I would say for the other legendary lord of the Greenskins, but for this one, at least early on, absolutely. But that's because of the low armor of goblin units in this particular uh, campaign. That's all there is to say. Quistine signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and enable notifications. And I'll see you boys and girls next time.